Hi, everyone. Thank you for stopping by this poster. My name is Ao Liu. I'm the Deputy Director of Research at Euclid Tech Labs. Today, I'm speaking on behalf of the team composed of both Euclid employees and also our collaborator at Fermilab, Dave Pushka. This project was funded by the DOE Office of Science a High Energy Physics Department with the contract number DSC00019853. Today's topic is on emissivity enhancement and production of tungsten for production targets through thin film coatings, specifically for MUTE project. I would like to thank everyone involved in this project and the IPAC committee for organizing the event and also the program manager, um, John Boulder for uh, funding this project. Some background information for our studies. Uh, the passive cooling has been adopted for the current multi e production target design, which the thermal radiation is the primary source or even the only source for the heat transfer. The advantage of doing that is to avoid any active coolant or risk of uh, coolant leakage or um, add the, um, a lot of convenience to the remote target handling. Um, the, the disadvantage of using only radiation cooling is that the thermal fatigue and oxidation might happen at high temperature because of the possibly inefficient radiation cooling. The final ta target temperature will depend on the deposit power P, target surface area A, and uh, target materials total emissivity uh, epsilon T at all wavelengths. Um, depending on the polishing and aging for tungsten, the total emissivity varies from 0 0.5 to 0 0.3. The increase, an increased emissivity will allow for less surface area and larger deposit power for the multi target, which, is, which gives you less headache for hazard. Let me switch back to a pen. There are two ways to expedite the radiation cooling. One is to increase the surface area to the target, which is currently the focus for the collaboration. The collaboration has added a lot of fin structure and segments to uh, effectively increase the overall surface area. However, this approach will compromise the power yield um, and the secondary particle generation or the statistics uh, down the road. There, this other way, which is the focus for this research uh, is to increase the thermal emissivity through a thin film coating on the tungsten surface. There are several advantages to that approach. First of all, you can expedite the radiation cooling from all coated surfaces. It is shape independent and it is uh, robust at high temperatures larger than 1500 degrees C if a correct thin film is selected. Before we go ahead with the experiments, we would like to have some guidance from simulations. So first of all, we took the UTE target design from our collaborator, Dave Posca at Fermilab TSD. And then we did some thermal simulations in COMSOL where we used the Gaussian beam in transverse direction and a truncated Gaussian distribution in the longitudinal direction. And we used a four kilowatt absorbed DC beam power on the target. We defined the emissivity for all the surfaces, which was not an easy task for this completed structure. We tried two different emissivity values, 0.25 and 0.6 for the naked tungsten and a coated tungsten uh, respectively. 0.6 is an estimated emissivity from the thin film material. From the result of the simulation, we see that the peak temperature varied from 1600 Kelvin to 1300 Kelvin uh, for these two values of, of emissivity respectively. We assumed the room temperature for the ambient environment, and we assumed no heat transfer can, was allowed for the target except for radiation. So conduction cooling and the convection cooling 
were both disabled. So from the promising simu simulation result, we wanted to know what are the best methods to grow thin film on tungsten substrate. There are many kinds of deposition methods. They can mostly be categorized as two approaches. The first one is called the chemical vapor deposition or CVD. The advantage of using a CVD is that um, it is quite repeatable and the thin film quality is usually very high. However, CVD systems are less available and they do introduce chemical safety hazard. So not all the facilities can have CVD built and maintained. On the other hand, there is another approach called the physical vapor deposition or PVD. There are many setup parameters for PVD methods. They are not very repeatable depending on the operations and the environment setup. However, the hazard, safety hazard is much uh, comparably less. Um, sputtering is one of the PVD methods well adopted by the community. Sputtering systems are available in-house at Euclid and actually at Euclid Tech Labs, we have many sputtering systems enabling both DC sputtering and RF sputtering. For this study, we have built a dedicated RF sputterer for, with a 600 watt magnetron called Paprika. The Paprika uses a four inch mag key per target because it's RF sputtering, it can accept virtually any um, target material such as titanium nitride, copper, silicon carbide, silicon dioxide, and et cetera. And it can run at uh, mid 10 to minus eight torr base pressure. On the other hand, Euclid has access to two major nanomaterial facilities, the CFN facility at BNL and CNM facility at Argonne. We have uh, simulations enabled by Quantum Espresso, an open source software installed on both our cluster and the NERSC cluster supercomputer at LBNNL. Um, we, can, we also have access to CFN and CNM's uh, PECVD or plasma enhanced chemical vapor deposition facilities. I would like to acknowledge the custodians at C CFN of BNL and uh, many other colleagues and custodians at Argon for us to uh, characterize the thin films later. We have recently obtained access to the CNM facility at Argon for SCM, EDX, EFM, XPS, film matrix, and now including the uh, focus ion beam and transmission electron microscope characterizations of thin films. So as a summary, at Euclid, we can do end-to-end -end research on thin film applications in accelerator physics and technology. So for this study, we have many candidate materials. Most materials with high emissivity are non-conductive. Sorry about that. Because of that, um, and not, most of the non-conductive materials are not accepted and workable at FN and CNM, uh, that's why we had our RF sputtering system, Paprika, to help in this case. Um, there are many materials available. However, some of them do have oxidation problems, uh, such as the one that was tested uh, by uh, RAL in, in the UK. So the fatigue problem was seen for silicon carbide, for example, but silicon carbide itself has very promising uh, properties. Considering that we have selected silicon dioxide to be the top candidate because it's already oxidized and it has a very high melting point, also a high emissivity, relatively speaking. We did DFT simulations or density functional theory simulations, sorry for the typo, which gives us an estimate of the work of separation through a so-called total energy of the system. So when we put the thin film on some uh, slab materials, it gives the total energy of the system 
And when you vary the distance between the thin film and the slab material, you can then calculate the total energy depending on the distance. So we found that there is a local minima at 1.2 angstrom for this thin film to grow on the tungsten material, which means that it is energetically favorable for the thin film to grow. We assumed ep epitaxy, uh, but however, this might vary in reality because most of the substrates that we are dealing with are probably amorphous. So as mentioned in the previous slide, the silicon nitride is also a very good candidate material because of its high emissivity and high melting point. Again, for silicon nitride, there is a possibility of oxidation at high temperatures. However, uh, considering that the outcome or the resultant material silicon oxide has also superior properties, we have also tried silicon nitride at BNO through the PECVD method. We deposited silicon nitride on silicon wafer and tungsten, where X denotes that the stoichiometry has to be determined later. We have used the EDS method to determine the chemical components of the thin film and made sure that silicon and nitrogen are both on the surfaces. We used a cross-section SEM characterization and the film metric thickness measurement to estimate the uh, total thickness on the tungsten or the silicon substrate. The numbers we got from those measurements were consistent with what um, the PECVD recipe gave. So we were able to deposit about 700 nanometer in an hour or uh, equivalently 1400 nanometer for two hours. We did the EDX elemental mapping to confirm silicon and nitrogen were on the surfaces. Um, because this is a silicon wafer, the, the silicon peaks are uh, naturally a lot higher. The oxygen peak was there because as I said, the thin film may oxidize at elevated temperature. And also considering that we had to take it out from vacuum chamber for the characterization in the SEM and XPS later at BNL, um, the thin film may oxidize during the transportation. The oxygen peak was also found uh, in an XPS characterization at BNL. And I would like to thank our collaborator, uh, Chen Yu at BNL. So this is a potential problem for many thin film materials, not only for silicon nitride. So how about silicon dioxide? So again, this X denotes that the stoichiometry has to be determined later. So for this thin film, we know that the surface is already oxidized. So we don't expect the thin film to degrade with a prolonged time in air. And also we have done the SEM and the EDX elemental mapping on the cross section. We have discovered all the needed elemental peaks. The aluminum peak was here because uh, SEM holder was made with aluminum. Also, you can see the EDX measurement here. There was some rainbow uh, effect at the edges if you use the PCVD method because the plasma enhancement was pretty strong um, at the edges. The XPS measurement has also indicated that our thin film has all the needed peaks and also the uh, film metrics measurements had indicated that in that one, one hour, we can do three micron silicon dioxide on the wafers. Just out of curiosity and for future studies, we also did some coating with silicon nitride and silicon dioxide on the surfaces because we are expecting in the end that this combination will allow us to have a better adhesion with tungsten and also a higher emissivity and less oxidation compared to silicon nitride only. And the, thing, the film matrix measurement had indicated that we have very good composition uh, where we deposited silicon nitride and silicon dioxide uh, in sequence on silicon wafers. Also, we want to know after the deposition, if we have such a thick thin film, will that impact on the production of pion or the muons down the road. 
we did some jump force simulations and uses an 8 GV proton target on a three millimeter radius, 230 millimeter length tungsten rod. The simulation was divided into two steps where the target was first simulated and then the thin film. This is done because the tracking step size differs significantly for the uh, two materials. We, we found that for the low energy beams, there were some differences from uh, a naked tungsten and a thin film covered tungsten. Whether this is very critical for data analysis down the road is a critical study to be done in the future. So uh, we went on to do some evasivity tests. This work was done early in 2020 where the COVID just start, started to hit. Uh, unfortunately, because of that, we were not able to do many measurements. Uh, we basically did it at two facilities. One is the Fermilab thin film facility. However, we had to build the app apparatus for this test together with Fermilab personnel. Um, it was a bumpy road to the final setup, and but in the end, we were able to reach 1100 degrees C in the system. We also did uh, emissivity measurements at University of Missouri, a close collaboration we established because of this project. Their setup is mature because of other emissivity measurement requirements they had in the previous studies. And they have even established emissivity measurement standard and published that. So the work was started and done in early 2020, although we only had a chance to measure two coupons in the end. So you can see the setup in here is very different compared to the uh, newly built apparatus at Fermilab. They use, math, they use a method to um, take, weld the uh, thermocouples on the surfaces of the coupon and their holder can be adjusted to hold different lengths at least. The measurement result from the Fermilab test indicated that the thin film was intact at 1100 degrees C. The absolute value measure for the emissivity wasn't very meaningful. The University of Missouri test uh, involved two coupons, as I said in the previous slide. We were only able to switch on the high current source for 100 amps and reached 600 degrees C in the end because of the um, very, very short time that we had for this measurement because of COVID. We had measured uh, adjusted 0.4 uh, total emissivity for naked tungsten we provided, which is higher than what's published on the literature by 0.1. On the other hand, the silicon dioxide coated uh, tungsten had an adjusted emissivity of uh, 0.47, which is lower than the bulk silicon dioxide reported at 0.65. Still, we were able to show that the emissivity has increased from um, only the, the naked tungsten. For both of these tests, either at 1100 degrees C or at 600 degrees C, and during the measurement, we did not see any degradation or detachment of the thin film, which was very promising for our future studies. So talking about the thin film uh, hesion and the protection effect on, uh, for the tungsten, we also did protection study on purpose. So in this study, we had put naked tungsten and the coated tungsten in a nitrogen purged high temperature furnace at uh, Euclid in our Bolingbroke facility. We have an oxygen sensor which reads the oxygen level and in our test, this corresponds to a effective 10 to minus two tor, which is still um, higher than the 10 to minus four tor where the mu e will usually operate at. Um, still, this will give us some insight on how quickly the tungsten can um, oxidize at elevated temperature. So we did this study for 24 hours at 1000 degrees C. And we did some SEM measurement of the um, two surfaces 
after the uh, heat treatment. You can see that for the naked tungsten, the surfaces had um, almost completely oxidized and form a nanopillar structure under the SEM. You can also see the edges had oxidized so much for both the coated and uncoated tungsten that they started to generate some dust on the silicon holder, silicon wafer holder underneath right here. However, if you look at the, uh, this is after treatment, you, if you look at the thin film protected tungsten, you can see the metallic color still is preserved after the heat treatment. Although, because as I said, there are some edge effect, the, thin, the edges were not covered very well by the thin film. So that's why you could see that um, oxidation still occurred at the edges. Still at the center of this region, we did the SEM measurement and found that the um, surface periodization was almost unchanged compared to a silicon dioxide coated tungsten. You can see the amorphous thin film on the tungsten surface, um, although it might be a combination of a very gentle or slight oxidation of the tungsten underneath and the thin film on the top. So further studies can be done to reveal the real physics going on. Not to scare anyone, but uh, we did a very brave, but also aggressive test. We put tungsten uh, in the air furnace at 780 degrees C uh, for 30 minutes. Uh, if, you, uh, if you do it at a higher temperature, the tungsten will start burning. And please don't ask me how I learned that. The tungsten surface had totally oxidized after this treatment. And you can see this beautiful but dangerous tungsten oxide color after the treatment. These will generate dust later if you uh, keep doing the oxidation and also they will fall apart. The whole tungsten will be oxidized and fall into dust. So it means that with residuals in the mediocre vacuum, you will want some protection for the tungsten ideally with a correctly chosen thin film. For the future work, we still want to do the systematic study on the emissivity and also the thin film quality. Um, we had built a high vacuum apparatus to measure the emissivity of the coupon at Euclid. However, that involves a lot of tests and also operation um, safety reviews if we wanna do this. This was designed, although, to um, tolerate 250 amp and up to 1,000 degrees C for any substrate highlighted in here. This is, by the way, held in the paprika chamber after the magnetron is removed. We want to do more systematic characterization of the thin film so we know the chemical composition of the thin film and how they would be able to protect the surface, and especially um, how the re different recipes will affect the final emissivity measure. We hope to further strengthen our collaboration with either Fermilab or uh, University of Missouri or both to measure the emissivity in a more systematic and a complete way. And we are sure that the pr same principles can be applied to other purposes, not only to HCP targets. As a summary, Euclid has successfully grown thin films of high emissivity materials on tungsten coupons, including uh, silicon dioxide, uh, silicon nitride, and silicon carbide. Both PCVD and in-house high power RF sputtering were tested and used for the thin film depositions. We have all the simulations needed to indicate the usefulness of the thin film, including the thermal simulation, using COMSOL, DFT simulations using quantum espresso, Gian4 simulations for the particle uh, production, and all the above can be optimized and systematically studied further down the road. The initial experiments of the emissivity tests are very, very promising, um, where the preliminary data showed improved emissivity from uh, a coasted tungsten compared to an, a naked tungsten. 
And we have demonstrated very effective oxidation protection, um, both from a nitrogen purged high temperature uh, furnace and a series of emissivity tests at uh, University of Missouri and Fermilab. We have also uh, proven that the thin films were intact at high temperature for the emissivity measurement, at least. And there are currently three sites for further measurements. And I would emphasize that University of Missouri and Euclid are still in a close collaboration and the con connection for uh, the future setups. I would like to acknowledge all of the personnel involved in this research, uh, including our colleagues from Fermilab, University of Missouri, Brookhaven, and Euclid. And I also would like to thank again the IPEG committee for allowing us to present this work at IPEG 2021. And I also want to uh, thank all the Euclid colleagues for their hard work and the program manager for funding this project again. That's all for my presentation. And if you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the chat and I will address all your questions or concerns or comments um, accordingly. Thank you for stopping by again. And I hope to see you or talk to you in person at some point. Bye-bye.